Well, earlier today, President Biden signed an executive order to expand access to abortion in the wake of the U.S. Supreme Court ruling that overturned the infamous Roe and Casey decisions. Now, in his remarks, the president claimed the nation needs to be protected from an extremist agenda. I would agree, but it's not the one he's thinking of. And that rights have, have uh, been taken away by the court. He also recognized that what the court did in the Dobbs case has an impact that could extend beyond the issue of abortion. Remember the reason of the decision has an impact much beyond Roe and the right to privacy generally. Marriage equality, contraception, and so much more is at risk. Well, is the president correct? Well, with me now to talk about this is someone who has been credited with having laid the groundwork that toppled Roe v. Wade, former Texas Solicitor General Jonathan Mitchell. Jonathan, welcome back to Washington Watch. Thanks, Tony. Good to be with you again. Well, let's start this discussion by talking about Dobbs. What are some of your thoughts on the ruling and the majority opinion? Very strong opinion. Overrules Roe completely as expected, based not only on the draft opinion we saw earlier, but also based on oral arguments. And the issue has been returned to the states. There's obviously a lot more for states to do. There are states that are anti-abortion that have trigger bans in effect, but they've already been blocked by state courts. So this won't be the end of judicial involvement in state abortion policy, but it does remove the federal judiciary from second guessing legislative decisions. And for anti-abortion people, that's a big step in the right direction. It is. And you have been credited with laying the kind of the groundwork which brought down uh, Roe v. Wade. And part of that is going back to the, the Constitution. I mean, and essentially, that's what Alito did in his majority opinion when he just basically erased the language of Casey that says that you have the right to basically, I'm paraphrasing, uh, to create your own reality. That what we've seen, and the left is going crazy because it, I find it very, very interesting that they snuck something in. They said we found this in the you know the shadows of the Constitution. This is a right, and so they felt like it was preserved forever. But now we have a court that's gone back to the Constitution and not seeing it as a living, breathing document, but a textual d a view of this document. So. Is this, a, is this a sea change when it comes to our Supreme Court? It's certainly a move in a more textualist direction. And I think some of our friends on the left who espouse the idea of a living constitution, there's some tension between that idea and their simultaneous claim that a precedent like Roe against Wade should be sacrosanct and therefore immune from overruling. I mean, if the constitution lives and breathes and evolves and changes over time, it's hard to understand how they can simultaneously insist that a judicial precedent is sacred when they don't think in any way we should be controlled by the text or what the framers think, but they do think we should be controlled by what some justices on the Supreme Court said 50 years ago. So I don't see the conservative Supreme Court majority right now embracing the living constitution by overruling Roe, but they are saying that if a right is not mentioned in the text of the document, it's not going to be recognized by the court unless it's deeply rooted in history and tradition. And that was the test that Justice Alito set out in his majority opinion and I think that will be the task that controls for as long as the current Supreme Court majority holds. I, I want to go back to that precedent for a moment, because this is what a lot of people are now on the left zeroing in on, saying, well, you wait a minute, wait a minute. These justices lied because they said they observed precedent, and of course, the super president, precedent. Um, but this is kind of the way I see it as, as a layman, not one who argues before the court. But, you know, for them, precedent is basically saying because we hoodwinked the Americans and succeeded in creating these rights like abortion, they should be protected from this day forward and you can't get them. So it's like we got this done with our liberal left leaning court and now you can't touch it. Yeah, well, nobody lied at all in their confirmation hearings. No one ever said that they would preserve Roe against Wade. No one promised anything to any of the senators about how they would rule, at least in their public statements, to the Senate Judiciary Committee. All we got were statements from Justice Kavanaugh that said that Roe against Wade was settled law. And Roe was settled law at the time he made that statement in 2018. It was a precedent of the court. It had not been overruled, and it was settled at the time. That was not in any way a promise that he would never reconsider or overrule a decision. And even if the justices had made representations that their 
confirmations hearings about how they might rule, they're allowed to change their minds later. No one can actually be locked in to what they might have said. But the point is, no one ever said to the Senate that they would uphold Roe against Wade. No one ever promised that they would never overrule it. And statements that Roe against Wade is settled law was a truthful statement of the law as it existed at that time. It was not a promise to preserve and perpetuate Roe into perpetuity and keep it on the books forever. I mean, is it safe to say, Jonathan, that the only thing that's really settled is what is clearly written in the Constitution? Right. Constitutional rights that are in the text are rights that will last for as long as we have that text. Rights that are invented by judges, like the right to abortion, will last only for as long as you have a majority on the Supreme Court that is ideologically predisposed to support that right. So constitutional rights that can be created by the court can be taken away by the court. And the removal of the right is as legitimate as the creation if you believe that judges have the flexibility to depart from the text. So it's hard to understand how the left can complain about lawlessness. Now, they may have complaints that this is bad policy, If you support access to abortion as a policy matter, you may think that it would have been better for the Supreme Court to leave Roe in place. But that is not a rule of law judgment. That just goes to whether abortion is normatively desirable or whether access to abortion is normatively desirable. But those are questions normally we let the political branches decide. We don't think judges are the ones who should be making policy decisions. They're supposed to enforce the law. And decisions about trade-offs between the right to life on the one hand and women's ability to obtain abortions on the other is a type of quintessential policy trade-off that normally we have legislatures make. True. So true. But there are some that saying, well, wait a minute, the court has shifted away and, and people had begun to count on these rights. They took them away. And that is destabilizing uh, for our society. I, I want to talk about that. We're up against a break. I want to talk about it when we come back. And also, why the left was so surprised. In my view, I think they felt that this path that they were on in inventing rights, that that was the wave of the future. But I think they've been shocked. And I want to talk about how we got here and how that's preserved. All right, uh, Jonathan, thanks so much for uh, for sticking with us for this next segment. I, I want to ask you this, you know, touched on this. The left says the court should be concerned with the quote unquote real life uh, consequences of the court changing its mind on, on an issue. As you said, the court creates, the court can uncreate. But is that really the job of the court? Isn't the court supposed simply, simply supposed to determine the constitutionality of a matter and leave the policy to the, uh, to the elected officials? Well, that's what legalists and legal formalists think. There are some people, though, who view the court more as a political institution, and they're, they might be considered pragmatists or consequentialists, where they believe that ultimately the touchstone of proper judicial decision-making is what type of consequences will ensue. So there are two schools of thought, I think, when it comes to the courts. People who have more of what I would say a legalistic mindset, where you judge the correctness of decisions by the courts based on how well they interpret the relevant statutes, constitutional provisions, and others who think that should be there should at least be some practical leavening when judges decide how they go about deciding cases. So you know it's hard to say that one view is patently wrong, But uh, certainly I fall within the legalistic camp and I'm a lot more sympathetic to the idea that courts just aren't very good at deciding matters of policy. And those are decisions ultimately for the political branches to make. So, Jonathan, I now want to go to the other question. You know, to me, I think the left was surprised because the court has been doing their policy work for decades. I mean, Roe v. Wade is evidence of that. That's why they never bothered until recently when they thought it was uh, under potentially at risk that they decided, well, maybe we should codify it into law, which is an acknowledgement that it never was law. It was a court decision. Right. So I think, you know, they've captured the the institutions of higher learning, our law schools for the most part. And so they've been, I mean, this is, this is the mindset that they have been indoctrinating lawyers with. So they thought that this would continue to be the types of judges that we would have. But what we see now on the court is kind of an anomaly to what is progressing through our law schools. So were they caught by surprise? Perhaps. I don't think it was unreasonable for them to think that the membership of the Supreme Court would tend to be more sympathetic to liberal values and social issues. And there are reasons for that. Only lawyers can become judges. If you look at the legal profession and the political views in the legal profession, they are somewhat to the left of the median voter. And you have to be a highly educated person to get appointed to the Supreme Court. And more educated people tend to be more liberal on social issues. So I, doesn't, I don't think it was 
naive or unreasonable for people on the left to think that they would have an inherent advantage by having judges decide policy questions like abortion. What happened, I think, was something no one really could foresee. No one really expected Donald Trump to win the election in 2016. He wound up getting three appointments to the Supreme Court, even though he only served one term as president, where you have Barack Obama, who had two terms, only get two appointments. So they did run into some bad luck when it came to the appointments, and that shifted the balance of the court. But I do think the point you make is an important one. There's no mechanism in place to guarantee a liberal majority on the Supreme Court. There's no invisible hand that ensures that federal judges or Supreme Court justices will always be in the pro-abortion camp when it comes to making these decisions. So do you think that Donald Trump has set kind of a, a new standard, a benchmark that we're going to see the future Republican nominees measured against? I think that's probably right. But one other important point is that President Trump, unlike previous Republican presidents, did not have to deal with the judicial filibuster. The Democrats got rid of that under Harry Reid when it came to lower court judges. And then the Republicans eliminated the judicial filibuster for Supreme Court nominations after the Democrats filibustered Neil Gorsuch. So President Trump did have the advantage that he only needed 51 senators or 50 plus the vice president to get his judicial nominees confirmed. And President George W. Bush, by contrast, always had to face the threat of a Democratic filibuster, even when his party had the majority in the Senate. So you know, definitely the rules have changed. It's easier to get judges confirmed now. That's true both for Democratic presidents and for Republican presidents because the judicial filibuster is gone. But it really, you know, Harry Reid's decision in 2013 to get rid of the judicial filibuster was a big step on the road to reversing Roe because had he not done that, I think it would have been much harder for President Trump to get Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett confirmed because none of those three judges got 60 votes for confirmation. They're right. all under right. 60 vote threshold. So, so, Jonathan, final question for you. Um, I mean, I, I will just tell you, I'm, I'm very hopeful now that I've seen these uh, cases come out of the Supreme Court or return to the Constitution. That's why we fight for the Constitution. We believe it's a document that has staying power. Are we seeing, you know, through the courts kind of a, a revival of the Constitution? Possibly. I mean, there's certainly more sympathy toward textualism and statutory interpretation and constitutional interpretation. Justice Elena Kagan has said we are all textualists now. She made that comment in the context of statutory construction, but I think it also carries over to constitutional interpretation with the current membership of the court, but it could change. I mean, we have to remember the Warren Court 60 years ago, that was the heyday of what you might call liberal judicial activism. And even at the Warren Court's peak, no one could have foreseen at the time that Republican presidents would start making appointments to the court that changed the ideological balance. And that could happen here. I mean, the court could return to democratic control in time. It would only take a, an unexpected retirement or death, one or two of those during a democratic administration. So I think the point that we should all keep in mind is no one has a lock on any of our institutions. You know, the presidency, whether it's Congress, they go back and forth between parties. And it's true of the Supreme Court. It's slower for change to occur in the Supreme Court because of the appointment process. But eventually, nobody should ever think that their party will control the court forever. Liberals should not have thought that right. back in the 1960s with the Warren Court. But conservatives should not think that today. The court will eventually swing back. And it's important that the rules of interpretation that we have for the Constitution keep that possibility in mind. Right. And we continue to stay involved in the process of elections. Jonathan Mitchell, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, so good to talk to you today. Thanks, Tony. Have a good week. You too.